Yes, hello, uh, good morning. I'm Sergio Rushbaum from uh, the National University of Mexico. And uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Roy Meshulam for uh, today's uh, GeoTop uh, seminar. And uh, uh, he will be speaking about aspects of high dimension, dim dimensional expansion. Thank you, Roy, for speaking today in our seminar. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll talk about some aspects of uh, high dimensional uh, expansion. But this is a fairly new field, uh, lies at the intersection of uh, combinatorics and uh, topology with some uh, connections to algebra, number theory, representation theory, and probability. And as such, I think it would be of uh, some interest to apply topologies uh, also. Um, so I'll, the plan is as follows. I'll uh, first uh, recall the notion of uh, expansion in uh, graphs, and then uh, generalize it to the uh, co-boundary expansion of uh, simplicial complexes. Uh, this notion uh, arose in two uh, different applications independent ones, one to random complexes and the other to the topological overlap property. Uh, I will uh, give hints about uh, these two applications. Uh, <clears throat> then we'll uh, move to another uh, connection between expansion and uh, cover stability. Uh, we will first uh, talk about the classical uh, connection between G coverings and the uh, cohomology. And then we'll see that uh, <clears throat> two notions, deficiency and stability, which somehow measure the uh, proximity of a map to a genuine covering map, are actually connected to high expansion. Um, as an application, we'll uh, talk about the expansion of the uh, geometric uh, lattices, which is a uh, complexes that uh, occur frequently in combinatorics and topology. Finally, uh, we'll talk about a, another notion of expansion. This is an analytic notion called the spectral gap, connected to the high dimensional Laplacian, and we'll see an application of this notion to a hypergraph uh, matches. But let us start from the beginning. And the beginning is, of course, the graphical Chigger constant. So uh, suppose that we have a graph, uh, G on the vertex set B, and we have a subset S, subset of B, and S bar is the complement of S, and ESS bar is the number of edges between S and S bar. Okay, so we, <coughs> if the graph is connected, there will be edges between S and S bar, and the number of these edges can somehow tell us how strongly connected this graph is. But of course, we have to normalize. And the trigger constant is, uh, by definition, it's called H of G, is the minimum where the minimum is taken over all subsets of size, the V hat, of the number of edges in the cut SS bar, normalized by the size of X. Okay. And uh, we'll later see how to generalize this notion to high dimensional complexes, and this will be what's called the co-boundary expansion, which is the main notion uh, that will interest us. Okay, um, but first let's talk about the graphical spectral gap, which is uh, very closely related to uh, the figure constant. Now, given G, uh, we have the Laplacian of G, which is the V cross V matrix called LG, it has the degrees on the diagonal, and minus one in place UV if UV is an edge, zero otherwise. And <clears throat> the all one vector is clearly an eigenvector of this Laplacian with an eigenvalue zero, this is lambda one. Lambda two is the spectral gap of G, and it plays a key role in the many areas of mathematics, uh, for example, it controls the uh, the speed in which a 
random walk on Z converges to the uniform distribution. Okay, now what is the connection between the trigger constant and the spectral gap? This is a subject of two uh, classical results. One is the Alon Milman panel theorem, which says that the number of edges in the cut S, S complement is at least S times S complement over N times lambda 2 times the spectral gap. And therefore, by dividing uh, by S, what we get is that the Chilo constant is at least lambda 2 over 2. This means that if the spectral gap is bounded from below, then also the Chilo constant is bounded. Now, on the other direction, another classical result of Alon and the Duke says that is irregular, then we have a, an upper bound on the trigger constant, which is at most square root of 2b lambda 3. Este, okay. Now, uh, both a3 and lambda 2g are therefore essentially equivalent measures of the graphical expansion. Uh, now, what happens in higher dimensions? So, before we uh, dive into the uh, precise definitions, uh, <clears throat> let's say some uh, general things. Both notions, the trigger constant and the spectral gap, have natural high dimensional expansion. In contrast, however, with the one dimensional case, they are not equivalent and they occurred in different contexts. First, talk about the cohomological expansion. Then, this arose in two, uh, two different directions of research. One was concerned with random complexes, and the other is Gromov's celebrated uh, overlap property theorem. Uh, later on, it was observed by uh, Kaufman and Alex Lobotsky that this is related to property testing in theoretical computer science. On the other hand, the spectral gap of K Laplacian is an older concept. It uh, goes back to the 70s, to the Galen celebrated work on the uh, cohomology of discrete groups. Later, it had application to hypergraph mapping, which I'll mention later, and uh, also to random complexes or random flag complexes. This is work of uh, K. And uh, uh, <clears throat> today, it Today, high dimensional expansion also enters other areas of uh, uh, theoretical computer science, uh, and it's relevant to PCP and things like that. Um, okay, so let's let's go into uh, uh, definitions. Before we go into the formal definitions, let's uh, just set some notation for simplicial cohomology. So suppose we have a simplicial complex on a vertex set V and a fixed and abelian group R. And the I phase of sigma, which is a simplex with vertices V0 to VK, is just obtained by removing the I from, uh, from uh, all of them. And the co-boundary is just the usual uh, co-boundary uh, given by dk phi is the sum, alternating sum of phi on the faces of the sigma. Uh, as usual, uh, zk will be the k cycles and bk will be the k uh, co-boundaries. And the reduced uh, k homology is uh, zkx over dkx. Um, uh, Jose, just tell me if you hear me. Do you hear me? Yes, you we can me? hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we we'll need we we'll need the notion of weight of a simplex. So suppose that X in n minus one dimensional fuel complex, then we assign a weight to each simplex in such a way that if we look at the case simplices, what we will get, the weights will form a probability distribution. And 
the measure of the simplex, k simplex sigma, is proportional to the number of top dimensional simplices that contain it. So, for example, uh, the top dimensional simplices in this complex, there are three of them, each get probability quarter, a uh, third. Now, uh, for the edge, for the vertices, say, this vertex is adjacent to two uh, simplices, and this vertex is adjacent to three simplices. So its probability will be uh, three times three nines, and this probability will be two nines. And the same for the edges, for the uh, six edges. So we get, for each skeleton, we get a probability distribution. And once we have a K or chains, we have the norm or the Hamming norm of this K or chain to be the sum of the weights of the simplices such that phi is non-zero on these simplices. Okay. So this is this gives us a sort of Hamming uh, qualitative norm on K chain quotients. Okay. Once we have this, we we look back at the figure constant defined as ESS complement over S, and we <coughs> generalize it to complexes. So we have this uh, uh, numerator and denominator, and uh, we'll, we'll see what is the generalization of ESS complement and what is the generalization of S. So first, the numerator. The numerator is generalized by a cut of the co-chain. So what is the cut of the co-chain? Suppose that we have a co-chain is P, K co-chain. We look at DK, the differential of P, and we look at the weight of all tau's, which are K plus one simplices, such that DK P at tau is non-zero. For and sum all these ways. So for example, suppose that we have, we look, uh, we take R to be Z2, and we take this, again, this simplex, this complex, and we look at the <clears throat> one cochain which gets zeros on these three edges, four edges, and one on these two edges. Now, if you look at D1 of phi, it's supported on sigma one and sigma two. And therefore, what we have to do in order to compute D1 P norm is to take the, to sum the weights of these two simplices, and this turns out to be two-thirds. Okay. So this is the numerator. What about the denominator? The denominator is the co-boundary norm of phi. Now, what is the co-boundary norm of phi? <coughs> we take phi and we perturb it by a K co-boundary, namely by dk minus one of psi, where psi is a k minus one cote. <coughs> For example, take again this this cochain, one 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 here and zero 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 here. Its norm is five nine, so it's the weight of this plus the weight of this plus the weight of this. However, its co-boundary norm is smaller. Why? Because we can perturb it by this co-chain, one a uh, co-boundary, which is the D0 of one AB, where one AB is the uh, characteristic function of AB. So when we sum this and this, we see that we get zero on all edges, except for this edge, where we get one. Therefore, <coughs> actually this, is cohomologous, so to speak, to, to this. This is cohomologous to this, and therefore the norm is, is only 1 over 9, rather than 5 over 9. Now, uh, finally, to the proper definition. So again, we have, if we have a cochain, a K cochain phi, the norm of it is just the sum of the weights of its uh, support, and its co-boundary norm is the following, what we uh, mentioned before. And the co-boundary expansion is the minimum of dk phi over phi co-boundary 
where phi belongs to CK minus BK. Okay, now it turns out that this is up to some, some multiplicative constant. This is indeed, indeed coincides with H0 when we take, when we take a, a when we take the trigger constant. So the trigger constant and H0 are just multiples uh, of one another. And the key observation is that HK is, XR is positive if and only if the cohomology is zero, right? Because if the cohomology is zero, then DK phi, <coughs> DK phi is never zero unless you take a, unless you take the co-boundary. And therefore, what we get here is positive. Uh, in the other direction, if this is always positive, then obviously you don't have, it's ne this is never zero. DK phi is never zero unless phi is a co-boundary. Now, this, this uh, simple, uh, well, tautological observation actually uh, makes it reasonable to call HK X of R somewhat, somehow a measure of the cyclicity of X over R in dimension K. So the bigger HK is, we can say that the more K acyclic X is over the coefficient ring R. Okay, so this is our notion of co-boundary expansion. And, and let, me, uh, let me hint as to the origins of this uh, notion. Uh, the, first, the first observation is the, this, <coughs> what happens with the simplex. So A, it turns out that the simplex, as we can expect, is very good expander. Indeed, HK minus one of the simplex is N over N minus one. It's even a little bit bigger than one. And this is sharp. This is a result of uh, myself and uh, Valach and uh, of Gomo. And uh, it's sharp. For example, when we take uh, k equals to two, so we have uh, we have this uh, tripartite complex, and we take the co the one core chain which gets one on all edges here. Then it's easy to show that essentially this is a reduced one core chain. And D1 of this one core chain consists of all colorful simplices. And a simple computation will show that actually H1 of delta n minus 1 here is, is uh, n over n minus 2. Um, OK. Uh, where, this, where does this came out? Uh, well, its first occurrence concerns uh, random complexes. So uh, let's, let me talk a little bit about this model of random complexes. So let Y be a simplicial complex. Yi is the skeleton, I skeleton of the Y. Yi is the oriented I-dimensional synthesis. Fi is the number of oriented I-dimensional synthesis and delta N is a simplex. Now, <laughs> We will have the probability space Y, K, and T, which consists of all complexes that are obtained as follows. First, take the K minus one skeleton of delta N, and then add each K simplex with same probability independently with probability P. Okay, this gives a rise to a complex Y, which is co <coughs> containing the K skeleton, contains the K minus one skeleton. And now one can ask various questions about the generic behavior of such a complex. When does this homology appear? Uh, when it vanishes, when what happens, <coughs> when it, what happens to the uh, fundamental group and so on. So one of the first results in this direction is the following. <coughs> it tells us that, ex that there is a sharp threshold for the vanishing of A K minus one cohomology vanishes. Okay, and this turns out 
to be uh, actually very connected to the notion of expansion. I think I'll, I'll skip the exact explanation, but somehow the point is that it turns out that most potential cost cycles that we have to consider have large, uh, have large um, co-boundary norm, and therefore by, by the result of the uh, uh, independent result of myself and Varlach and Gomo, it also has large uh, dk minus one phi norm, and therefore we can estimate the probability that a single phi will be a genuine k minus one cos cycle of y with f2 coefficients, or actually with r coefficients, it doesn't matter. In any case, uh, this, is, this is one of the origins of the notion of expansion. Uh, the other origin is, uh, is very interesting, and, uh, and it's called the overlap property. So let me tell you a little bit about the overlap property. Suppose that we have a subset of n elements, n points in Rk, and we have a point in Rk, we define gamma a of t of this point to be the number of k simplices made out of these points. So just take any k plus one points here, form a simplex, and check whether this simplex contains p or not. And just count the number of simplices that contain p. Now, a beautiful theorem of Barani from uh, 80, um, from the early 80s, says that whatever A is, there exists a P in RK such that the number of sim K synthesis that contain this P is just a fraction of the total number of K synthesis, which is N choose K plus one. And this total, this uh, uh, fraction is, in his computation was one over K plus one to the K, but this constant was uh, never claimed to be the best one, and indeed it's not the best, and it can be improved. So this is the picture. You have, you have this point P, and it belongs to many, many uh, simplices. For example, the red, the uh, blue simplex, the red simplex, the green simplex, the brown simplex, and so on. Now, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that, Gromov found an amazing topological generalization of this uh, result. What Gromov proved was the following. Suppose that you have any continuous map from the n minus one simplex into RK, then there exists a point, so this red point P, such that it belongs to the image of a fraction of all k simplices contained in delta n. The number of k simplices contained in delta n is n choose k plus one. And now what Gromov claims is whatever the map is, so you can see that it's not an affine map, it's just a fairly, uh, fairly wild map. Whatever this wild map is, there is a point that belongs to the image of a fraction of the, num of the number of k synthesis contained in the n minus one symbol. So this is a far-reaching uh, generalization, and in fact, uh, this constant is even better than, uh, than what we had in uh, Barney's theorem, in a, in just a little bit better. The difference is an exponential in, uh, uh, in k uh, uh, number. But actually, Gromov proved even something more spectacular, and this, this one is connected to expansion. And Gromov theorem, general theorem, is the following. Suppose that we have any simplicial complex, not only delta n, but just any, any simplicial complex x, and we look at continuous map from x to rk, then if this is a good expander, so if there exists an absolute epsilon such that hi, the cobandary expansion of x is at least epsilon, then indeed there is a point 
that it belongs to the image of a fraction of the number of k simplices in x. So when you take x to be delta n minus 1, the n minus 1 simplex, you, uh, you recover uh, Gromov's previous theorem, but this is, of course, much, much, uh, much deeper. And then, and this is indeed the cornerstone of uh, much mod modern research in, uh, in uh, convexity and uh, combinatorial geometry. Um, okay, so uh, so this is for the introduction, uh, so the notion of co-boundary expansion and two of its applications. And now we can uh, move to the question of the <coughs> stability theorem and expansion, and we'll, <coughs> we'll uh, preface this by some comments about the uh, topological structure defined by local, local conditions. So we, of course, know that many topological structures are defined by local conditions, for example, covering spaces. Uh, so this is an example of the Z3 covering space of the circle. And vector bundles, this is an example of the Mebius, uh, Mebius vector bundle uh, over S1. Uh, these notions are defined locally. So, for example, uh, a vector, uh, Covering space is just uh, map between two spaces such that locally this uh, this map is a uh, homeomorphism. Um, okay. Uh, now uh, these often such structures are uh, have cohomological classification. So, for example, vector bundles, real vector bundles over a X, a compact X are uh, classified by uh, H upper one X with Z2 coefficients and uh, complex line bundles over X are classified by H upper two X with uh, integer coefficients and covering spaces are classified by uh, G covering spaces are classifying, classified by a non-abelian cohomology of X with uh, uh, G coefficients where G is any, any group. And they will have uh, more to uh, say about this. And now uh, we aim at the following sort of approximate cohomological classification. And we and the idea is as follows: um, we have assumptions. So the assumption is that we have a family of structures on a space X that are defined by local conditions. These can be covering spaces or vector bundles and so on. The second assumption is that membership in this family is classified by cohomology group HKX with some system of coefficients. The third assumption is that the co-systolic co expansion, which I'll explain in a minute, it's very closely related to co-boundary expansion, which we defined before, that this expansion is large, or at least bounded away from zero. And the tentative stability statement that we, we drive to and we, or we wish, we wish for is the following. Suppose that the object S satisfies most of the local conditions that define the structures on the space X, okay, that define EX. So, what we want to claim is that if the object satisfies most of the local conditions, that S is globally close to the structure, to a structure in EX. Of course, this is quite vague, and uh, so what I'll try is to make this reasonable for at least one example. And the example that, uh, uh, that we'll care about will be G-covering maps of the uh, Compact complex. But we need uh, some uh, some definitions, namely of a non-abelian cohomology, first cohomology. So suppose G is a multiplicative group, X is a simplicial complex on G, and again X K are the K simplices, and X odd K are the ordered K simplices. Now G-valued cochains are simply functions from X odd K to G that satisfy the skew symmetry, but uh, with uh, multiplicative mutation. So phi of uh, v phi zero to v phi k is phi zero to v k to the, uh, to the power of 
either plus or minus one, depending on the sign of pi. And we have a co-boundary operator. So the co-boundary operator from C0 to C1, it has to act on UV. So D0 psi UV is psi U times psi V minus one. And D1 C1X to C2X is D1 psi phi UV. W is phi UV, phi VW, phi WV. Just multiplicatively writing the differentials. Okay. And uh, we have the notion of one co cycles. What are one co cycles? These are just uh, one co chains such that D1 phi at UVW is one for any UVW in the complex. Additionally, we have an action of C0 on C1. This is a new ingredient that doesn't, doesn't uh, exist really uh, in this form in the abelian case, but uh, C0 acts on phi1, but uh, by psi acting on phi at uv is psi u, phi uv, psi v to the minus one. And we look at the orbit of phi under C0. And the one cohomology is just the collection of orbits of phi under the actions of C0. And this is no longer, of course, a group, but it's a set and it is relevant to a covering questions. Um, okay, so uh, just, just uh, give me a hint that uh, you hear me. I, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, okay. Um, okay, what, is, what are G coverings? G coverings in the case of simplicial complexes. So as we have a simplicial net y from y to x. And we call it a covering if for any u in as a vertex of x and a v which is a, a pre-image of u, the induced map between the links these, uh, of these two vertices is an isomorphism. This is the simplicial version of just a usual definition of covering map. And additionally, this covering map is called G covering if V acts simplicially on Y and simply transitively on the fibers uh, of P. Uh, so the fibers can be identified with G. Um, so let's look at an example, uh, just the cover of the projective end space. So <clears throat> first, uh, a triangulation of Sn that we choose is just taking the uh, barycentric subdivision of the boundary of the C n, um, n simplex, n plus one simplex. So here the simplices are just, the vertices are just subsets of uh, one to n plus two, and the simplices are just chains of uh, subsets. A0 contained in A1, contained in AK. So this is triangulation, the fine triangulation of Sn. And the corresponding triangulation of Pn is just taking A0 A to AK, but rather than taking A0, take the pair a0 and its complement. A1 and its complement, AK and its complement. And the fact is that the map that takes A to PA is a simplicial uh, Z2 cover. So for example, here we have this barycentric subdivision of the boundary of the three simplex. And here we have uh, the corresponding, corresponding triangulation of P2. And this is the uh, covering map. For example, if we look at the X, we look at this vertex, one, four, two, two, three. It's a uh, three images are two, three, and one, four. And we see that the link here are isomorphic. So all of these links are just the uh, boundary of squares. Okay. Uh, so this is an example. Now, what is the connection of the G coverings with homology or cohomology? Uh, suppose that we have any co-chain, one co-chain on X, 
we define a simplicial complex y phi whose vertex set is just the vertices of x cross b and the simplices are all collections of k plus one pairs u0 g0 uk bk such that u0 to uk is an original syntax of xk and additionally t ui uj we call the this is t is a one chain. so this is an element of v times gj is equal to gi so this gives us tells us which are the simplices of y phi and a classical fact due to steenwald or perhaps uh, earlier is that the projection from y phi to x given by p u g uh, goes to u is a g covering if and only if phi is actually a, a one cos cycle so there is a correspondence between one cos cycles and g coverings so g coverings are really uh, parameterized by the one homology <laughs> of x okay so this is a precise uh, characterization and now uh, we would we care about we want to ask what happens if the mapping is not exactly a g covering does it correspond to a phi which is close to a one cos cycle and the answer is yes provided that the expansion of x with respect to g is big um, okay so we have we have to define some notions Suppose that we have any subjective map from y to x and the u tilde is in the prime image of u. We want to, find, to define the local deficiency of f at u tilde. Now, if really the link of u tilde goes to the link of u isomorphically, then the deficiency would be zero. Otherwise, we count the number of edges that are present in the link of u but are not in the image of link of u tilde, okay? E that belongs to link x of u, but not in the link of y u tilde. This is the local deficiency at u, and the total local deficiency is an correct, uh, is an averaging of this local deficiency. So we think of the deficiency as a local measure of a measure of the uh, of the uh, distance between y and a genuine cover, a local map. Now uh, we have also a global map. So uh, again, as in the as in the abelian case, we have the norm of p and the norm of d one p, and we define the cosystolic norm of p, which is closely related to co-boundary norm but can be, uh, can be a little different. It's the minimum of P dot times a pointwise product with Psi minus one, where Psi is a, co, uh, as a, is a co cycle of X. So for example, if there are no cos, if all co cycles are co-boundary, then the phi cosystolic norm coincides with the, the phi co-boundary norm. But in general, uh, uh, one can be uh, zero and the other can be non-zero. Okay, and the cosystolic one expansion is just as before, as in the Abelian case, is the minimum of d1 phi divided by the phi cosystolic norm. Here we take phi belonging to c1 minus z1, so phi cannot be, a, of course, a, a, a cocycle uh, because otherwise uh, this the, the the denominator will be zero. Okay, and now, now here is the, the observation. It says the following, that if we have a finite group that for any f that belongs to, that is a cochain, there exists a phi which is a cos one cos cycle, such that the distance between f, this f, and this cos cycle is bounded by the local deviation from the covering divided by the expansion. 
This is a joint work with uh, Enrique Binot, Eric Binot, sorry. And it says in words, it says the following. Suppose we have a complex with a bounded below expansion H1. So this H1. And we let F be a one crochet. Then roughly speaking, if the deficiency of the projection from YF to X is small, so we are locally, most, at most point we look like a cover, then F is globally close to a real cover. So technically speaking, F is close to a one core cycle in H1, X3, and therefore YF is close to a genuine cover. Um, Okay. Uh, any any questions about this uh, this uh, result or hmm? okay? So so let me let me proceed. Uh, <clears throat> one uh, one instance of the application of this result is the to the cover stability of the spherical buildings. Um, so let us recall what is the building A3FQ. So the vertices here are the non-trivial linear subspaces of the FQ to the fourth, so the four-dimensional uh, subspace over the uh, field with few elements. And the face, uh, face sets, namely the top synthesis, are chains of subspaces F1 containing F2 containing F3. Now, uh, now what happens to to H1, then the claim is that H1 of A3FQ of this complex is independent of the group G and independent of Q. Q can go to infinity. It's bounded below from uh, zero. So it's at least one over nine. And the corollary is that if F is a one core chain, then there will always exist a one core cycle, P, such that the distance between this one core chain and this a one core cycle is at most nine times the discrepancy of YF or the, the local uh, local distance from a uh, covering. And now uh, I, I don't think I have a lot of time to actually describe the proof of this, but let me just say that, uh, let me say a few words about this type of simplicial complexes. So, a3 is actually an example of a geometric lattice. So what are geometric lattices? Let's first talk about faucets. So faucets are just uh, order, uh, just well, partially ordered sets. And to a faucet, we associate an ordered complex whose vertices are just the elements of P and whose case simplices are just chains, A0 less than A1, less than A2. Geometric lattice is just a lattice with the uh, with this uh, inequality. Namely, if we have any two elements, then the this, this sum of the ranks is at least the rank of the join plus the rank of the knee. Uh, now, an old uh, theorem of Folkman says that if L is a geometric lattice uh, of rank, the rank of one, the top element is N, then if we remove the top and the bottom elements, what we get is just a bunch of a bouquet of spheres of dimension n minus two. In particular, if uh, n is uh, if n is at least four, then l bar is uh, is simply connected. Well, it's just a bouquet of, uh, of spheres of dimension two or uh, or more. And therefore, uh, all, its, all its cohomology, all its one cohomology, irrespectively of G, is zero. Um, now, um, uh, there, is a, there is a technique of uh, proving lower bounds for uh, geometric lattices, lower bounds on the expansion. And um, I'll, I'll just uh, indicate this, uh, the idea here. Um, the idea is as, is as follows. Suppose that we have a, a probability space that uh, parameterizes a, sub, a set of linear orderings on the atoms of, uh, of A. So these are the atoms of this faucet. 
And for each S in S, we have some linear ordering of these atoms. And uh, we take uh, A to be the minimum of A under this, uh, under this ordering. And we take uh, BS, Z1, to be the minimal element, the minimal atom that is smaller than V1, and Bs, V0, the minimal atom that is smaller than V0, assuming that V0 is less than V1, this implies that As is less than Bs, V1, and less than Bs, V0. Now, this allows us to define a subcomplex of, uh, of the of the uh, order complex of the lattice, which is this, this small, it has only nine faces. And uh, this is a crucial element in the, in the estimate, lower estimate of the H1 of the X, H1 of L. And uh, the claim is that you can bound the uh, H1 of L bar as follows. You take for each, each two, three simplex, you look at all V0, V1, all edges, such that this, this gadget contains tau somewhere here, this, in one of these uh, nine simplex. And now you average this over all, you average this over the, uh, the weight of tau. Now, it turns out that H1 uh, L bar is at least the uh, maximum of this uh, quantity uh, to the minus one. Uh, well, I, I believe this could be a little bit uh, faster to too fast, but in any case, this allows us to, uh, this allows us to lower bound H1 and actually uh, with some uh, use of the transitivity of uh, GL4 of, on the uh, on the building that uh, we deal with, uh, one can show that all these are all these numbers are actually equal. All the deltas are equal, and uh, they are all at most nine, and therefore the maximum to the minus one is at least uh, one over uh, nine. Uh, okay, so this is uh, for uh, the expansion of a three f q and. It turns out that this method can be applied also to other uh, complexes and give uh, fairly sharp uh, lower bounds on the expansion. But I should say uh, with all honesty that actually there are many complexes for which we conjecture that the expansion is uh, bounded away from zero, but we have no idea how to approach this problem. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, so I have a few minutes, and uh, uh, Jose, do, do you want me to answer questions, or should I move to, a, to another topic? Uh, you yes, I can hear you. Yes, we have about uh, less than 10 minutes, so uh, as you prefer, yeah. Uh, Okay, okay, so, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, another notion of expansion. These are the, uh, the sorry, this is the notion of, uh, this is the analog of the spectral gap. And um, this is the, talks about the higher Laplacian. So, uh, now we are talking about the uh, real coefficients and we have CK of X is just the, uh, just the real co-chains and we have the natural inner product of them, just uh, T times T dot Psi is just the sum of uh, T sigma Psi sigma where sigma is a, a K simplex. And we have the adjoint with respect to this inner product. And we take the K Laplacian to be just the, the usual up and down and down and up, namely dk star plus dk star dk plus dk minus one dk minus one star. This is a this is an operator from ck to itself, and this is a, the exact a generalization 
in the case of k equals zero of the graph Laplacian. Um, okay, uh, again, just as in the case of graph Laplacian, this is a, a self adjoint a positive a semi definite operator, and its kernel is, is just all k co chains such that dk phi and dk star, dk minus one star phi are both zero. And the simplicial Hodge theorem tells us that the kernel of this Laplacian, K Laplacian, is, uh, is isomorphic to the reduced uh, K cohomology of X with R coefficients. Now, in contrast with the usual, uh, with the uh, uh, Riemannian uh, Hodge theorem, which is uh, hard to prove, this is uh, very simple. There are no analytic uh, there are no analytic uh, complexities here. And it gives us the following criterion for the vanishing of uh, HK. So let mu KX be the minimal eigenvalue of delta K, of the K Laplacian. Then mu K is positive if delta has no zero eigenvalues. In other words, if HK is H upper K and therefore also H lower k are zero. So uh, this trivial, uh, so to speak, uh, observation is uh, actually paves the road for um, uh, analytic, uh, analytic proofs of uh, cohomology vanishing. And this is very common in cohomology. This is, uh, uh, this is called, and it's an old technique, uh, it's called Bochner method. And indeed, uh, what I'll show you in a minute, is a kind of a kind of discrete version of the Bochner method, of some aspect of the Bochner method. And we'll apply uh, this uh, discrete Laplacian to flag complexes. Now, a flag complex of a graph is simply a simplicial complex on the vertex set whose simplices are all cliques uh, of the graph. So if this is the graph, this is the flag complex. And uh, our result is uh, the following. This is joint work with um, Rona, Roni, and Ellie Berger. It says the following. Suppose G is a graph on N vertices. Then we already talked about its second spectral gap or second eigenvalue. Now, the claim is that if you know that lambda 2 is big, then also mu k of the whole complex, of the whole free complex is also big. And this is the inequality. Mu k, the minimal eigenvalue of A, the minimal eigenvalue of delta k of the clique complex X is at least k plus one times the spectral gap of the underlying graph minus k times N. In particular, if lambda two of G is bigger than K minus one times N over K, then plugging this into this inequality tells us that HI of XG with real coefficients is zero for all I between zero and K minus one. And um, it turns out that this, this uh, result, which was proved in the context of uh, with some matching theorem for hypergraphs is, uh, is relevant to hypergraphs. And the relevance is as follows. Suppose that we have, a, we have M hypergraphs, F1 to Fn, a system of disjoint representatives for this family of hypergraphs is a choice of pairwise disjoint sets from each of these hypergraphs. So, for example, this hypergraph, this a collection of four hypergraphs, has an SDR. Just take this set and this set, the black set, the blue set, the red set, this red set, and this green set. You see that they have all they have different colors and they are pairwise disjoint. On the other hand, if you take this uh, family of for hypergraphs, then they do not have an SDR because once you take a black, a red, 
and a green set, then you can no longer fake a blue set. Okay. And now the question is, can we, when can, can we decide when something has an SDR? The answer is that uh, the answer is that there is no uh, a computationally uh, efficient way to do it, but there is some uh, very very nice result that actually tells us a sufficient condition. And one of these results is the Aroni access theorem, which says the following: suppose that we have m hypergraphs, each of them is uniform of uniformity r. So each element of Fi consists of an R set. Then if the matching number of the union of any uh, subfamily of this family, Fi, where I belongs to I, if the matching number is bigger than R times I minus one, then F1 to Fn has an SDR. And actually when in the simple case where R is equal to one, this is just the whole famous whole matching theorem. Now, uh, I have only one minute, two minutes left, so I'll just tell you what is the use of this cohomology vanishing that I mentioned before. This cohomology vanishing allows us to extend the, uh, the extend the Aroni Axel theorem. Uh, and it says the following, now we can replace the condition, the sufficient condition, ni bigger than r times i minus one, to ni star uh, of the union bigger than r times i minus one. Here, nu star is what's called the fractional matching number, which turns out to be very often much larger the, than the usual matching number. And therefore, this is a stronger uh, theorem. And there are other similar applications of uh, homology vanishing in this area of the uh, of, uh, hypergraph uh, matching. And then um, here is my last slide. 